morning, Calvary. Sons and daughters of God Most High, let's stand and declare that Christ is our all in all. Let's take it from the top right here. Sons and daughters. Sons and daughters of the King, rise up and sing that Christ is all in all. Sing the glories of His name together, proclaim that Christ is all in all. Fellowship Sunday. Uh, it's great to see you all here. Once a year, we all get together, our 9 o'clock and our 1030 worship services. We all get together. We have a great time of fellowship and a great time to see who gets the pew first. But in any case, uh, just welcome. Glad to have you all here. And if you're a newcomer visitor to Calvary, please fill out the Calvary Connection card. You'll find that in the pew racks. Just fill it out, drop it in the offering plate. 
not just record of your attendance, but if you're a newcomer visitor, we want to get to know you. And if you have any prayer requests, please put that down too. So make sure you fill out the connection card, drop it in the offering plate, and we will follow up. And this morning, our children and students will be passing baskets for a monthly coin offering. The funds collected will be used for special purchases for the next generation ministry. Now, I'm going to come back up here at the end of the service to give you instructions on what to do after the service because after the service, we're going to have a, a luncheon and we have a number of activities. We have an inflatable, we have some games. We just, it's a great time of fellowship, a time to be active. So I want you to hang around. We serve about 700 people, and I try to keep it under 20 minutes so you won't be in line very long. And if you run out of food, it'll be even shorter. <laughs> but, uh, but in any case, uh, please welcome. And I'll give you instructions after, we, uh, after the service ends, after communion, as far as how to get out there in the back parking lot and uh, what's just going to happen. But that's it for announcements. I'm going to ask uh, Pastor Brett. And uh, Jake West, our next generation director, uh, for a special introduction. Hey, thanks, Dan. Well, as all of you know, this is the intrepid Jake West. I say intrepid because he oversees our, all of our next-gen ministries from birth all the way up through high school. That's a huge responsibility in the church, and it's also one of the most strategic ministries we have in the church because, as you know, these are the faith formation years, and so we're so thrilled uh, to have Jake and uh, just so blessed by his ministry, and he has an exciting introduction uh, to make for us this morning. So Jake, hand it over to you. Thank you, Pastor. Good morning, Calvary. Um, yes, so I do have the privilege this morning of introducing y'all to our new uh, student ministry director, Nate, and his wife, Adriana. I'm going to go ahead and invite them up on a stage with me now, um, but before I get into that introduction and let them share a little bit about themselves with you all. I did want to give a brief overview, big picture of Next Generation Ministries here at Calvary. Um, and if many of you are like me, visuals help. Um, and I want our terminology to make sense to you all. As we're giving out church-wide communication um, and using phrases like Next Gen Ministry, Children's Ministry, Student Ministry, I want you to know what that means and understand it, obviously that'll help the communication, and then also know kind of what staff member um, is connected directly to that ministry. So as Pastor Brett mentioned, um, my oversight is really kind of just the breadth of next generation ministry, birth through 12th grade. So anytime we talk about next gen, next generation ministry, we're talking about that all the way from birth through 12th grade. So the whole scope of um, our next generation here at Calvary, um, but then that breaks down a little further, and this is where the communication part comes in. Our children's ministry, which is headed by Hannah Haney, she's the director of children's ministry, and then Laura West is our children's ministry volunteer coordinator. Um, that consists specifically of birth through fifth grade. So our nurseries, our twos and threes class, and then our pre-K and elementary classes um, on Sunday morning, our Awana, our VBS, anything that would affect birth through fifth grade. Um, we'll directly go to Hannah as the director and then Laura West as the volunteer coordinator because there are um, literally hundreds of volunteers needed for that ministry. Um, and then the second subset of that is student ministry, and that's where I get the privilege of introducing you all to, to Nate this morning. Um, he, his title as student ministry director um, gives him direct oversight of the 6th through 12th grade students specifically. Um, and then Dan Beeson is our student ministry coordinator. Um, he does a lot of the tech, a lot of our uh, social media, advertising, a lot of everything behind the scenes that is needed to allow student ministry to be accomplished. So while there is a, a lot of overlap and a huge blessing that um, the Lord has blessed Calvary with a team and we work together on a lot of things as a team within NextGen, there are specific subsets within that um, with children's ministry and student ministry where um, I think it was important for you to see that, kind of a picture of that, and see who is directly related to those ministries. Um, so with that, I will go ahead and introduce you to our new student ministry director, Nate, who started um, just about, not that long ago, maybe like a month, two weeks, not a month, uh, two weeks ago. Uh, time is blurry right now. Um, so Nate and Adriana, um, it's a huge blessing specifically to me. Um, but will be a blessing to you all as parents and to our students, I'm sure, in the coming years as well. So I wanted to start out 
uh, by just asking you both to please share a short testimony about yourself so we can get to know you a little better. Good morning, everyone. It's a privilege to be here with you all today. I'll try to keep it very quick. I was born and raised in Edison, New Jersey, which is about 45 minutes outside New York City. Uh, I was born with two other siblings, two younger siblings, uh, and I had both parents in the house to start at least. And uh, they would take my family to church every Sunday. Uh, on Easter, we'd open up the Bible before we did our Easter egg hunt. On Christmas, we'd open up the Bible before we opened presents. So uh, Christianity was a big part of my young life, but I really did not have a relationship with Christ at all. Uh, I knew all of the Bible stories from Sunday school, but I was not personally saved. And uh, this kind of uh, separation from Christ was exaggerated uh, when I was in fifth grade because my parents got divorced. And so I remember waking up one Saturday morning and my mom told me, oh, uh, dad's not living here with us anymore. So as a young person, my thought was, oh, if even bad things can happen to Christians, then what's the point? Like, why should I follow Christ at all? Now, thankfully, my mom kind of doubled down on her faith in this time despite the divorce. And so she made me and my siblings go to every church event possible, and that included youth group. So as a little seventh grader, I was forced to go to youth group, and I hated it, <laughs> at least to start. I really did. But uh, like I said, my mom was faithful in taking us to church. Um, there were folks I met at the youth group, uh, people my age, but also leaders who poured into me. And over time, uh, the Holy Spirit just broke down my heart. And I realized uh, it's not about what happens in your life that dictates your faith. It's about your personal relationship with Christ. And so when I went into high school, I put my faith in Jesus. I surrendered my life to him. Throughout high school, it was tough. I grew up in a public school um, in New Jersey, too. So, you know, uh, typical secular experience. All, none of my friends were believers. They all smoked. They all drank, uh, things like that. And so there was a lot of temptation in my life that distracted me from following Jesus. Thankfully, God was always there caring for me, guiding me. Uh, he made it so that when it was, came time to go to college, I had no choice but to go to Liberty University. It's a big Christian school. You might have heard of it down south. Um, but this is, this is the funny part. So I literally could not afford any other school, nothing in New Jersey, nothing near me except for Liberty. And when I went down there for the first time in my life, I met people my age, uh, men specifically my age, who loved Jesus enough to pour into me. And they wanted to see me grow in my understanding of Jesus just because they love me and they love Jesus. And so I would say around that time, I rededicated my life to Christ. I doubled down on my faith. And part of that rededication was realizing that I was being called to the ministry. I was being called to work in a church. And as a little sophomore in college, I didn't know what that looked like. But I said, God, I trust you, and so I'll follow you. And so I graduated from Rudy with my Bachelor's of Science in Pastoral Leadership with a minor in Youth Ministry. I was also this time at Liberty when I met my lovely wife, Adriana. That was a huge blessing. Uh, and as we were looking at graduation together, where we were going to live after we got married, uh, we weren't quite sure where we were going to go. For a time, we thought Florida, maybe back to New Jersey. God made the choice for us. Uh, we could not get any jobs except for in Michigan. <laughs> so... So my, life, uh, my wife actually works at Bronson right now. Uh, I've been working at the Kalamazoo Gospel Mission for the past year in their long-term rehabilitation program. Uh, it's been challenging experiences for both of us, but a huge, uh, a huge time of growth for both of us. Um, these people that we deal with on a daily basis, uh, they can be very frustrating, honestly, but everyone needs Jesus, and it's helped open our eyes to the ministry that can just be right outside our front doors. Uh, now, that year was challenging, but I think it's prepared me greatly for this time at Calvary. Um, we praise God for this opportunity, and we're looking forward to being here. Uh, I'm going to pass the mic over to Adri, and she'll add a few more details I probably missed. My name is Adriana. I'm the one on the right. <laughs> um, as Nate said, I'm currently a nurse at Bronson. However, I was born and raised on the mission field. My lovely missionary parents are actually here today. Look how cute they are. <laughs> but yeah, they were wonderful parents, and they definitely instilled in me a love for ministry, but most importantly, a love for Jesus. And so growing up, I got to firsthand witness what having a relationship with Jesus looks like and what that looks like pouring into others. And so as I went to college, I decided on a career in nursing, and now I'm a nurse in the ER, and I get to see people who are having the worst day of their life every day, 
that need someone to look to for hope, and I get to be that for them, and it's a huge blessing. And then also now, I get to work with young people alongside my wonderful husband, and get to inspire them and hopefully show them what faith in Jesus looks like and what that looks like on a day-to-day -day basis. So, yeah. Awesome. Yes. Thank you all uh, for sharing. It's great. it's great to hear how the Lord can use uh, different pieces, whether you're on the mission field or going through um, a divorce as a child to still bring you together and further his kingdom. So thank you for sharing. Uh, next, I was going to ask Nate just specifically, what is, some, what is something that excites or encourages you about coming to, to minister here at Calvary with our students? Like I said, when I was growing up, uh, a lot of my foundation was set in my elementary school years, so first through fifth grade. I really did know the stories. I could kind of throw back the answers to any questions you could give me in Sunday school. But just for me personally, as a kid, I did not understand the value of a personal relationship with Christ until I was in middle school. So for me, that's what's most exciting. I know not every kid is like me, but I know for a fact there are kids uh, right now whose foundation has been set, but they haven't quite understood the personal aspect yet. They don't understand yet that they need to commit their personal faith to Christ. And so that's what excites me. I remember as a young person, my eyes being open to that reality and my life transforming. And I wasn't some super mature seventh grader either. I was your very average, very typical kid. But still, I recognized what Jesus had done for me on the cross as powerful, as life-changing. And so that's what's exciting for me. Uh, I know there are plenty of kids here who are super mature, who have probably accepted Christ before they've been to high sc uh, middle school, but then there are others who are not. And I'm, I'm excited to see those types of kids have their eyes open to the gospel and the love that Jesus has for them. Thank you, thank you. And lastly, um, just what is something that we as a church family can be praying for, specifically for you and Adriana, um, maybe explicitly in your first year of ministry here together? Yeah, definitely uh, prayers for organic relationships. Uh, we don't want to uh, feel like we're forcing anything with the kids here. Um, as the Holy Spirit sees fit, we want to make those connections naturally. And I think that's, that's what's intimidating for us. We'll be honest, the type of people uh, we'd interact in our workplaces these last years, it's not exactly the people that you'd see uh, day after day and that you'd really form a relationship with. Usually they're in for a few hours and they're out, and that's just the nature of where we worked. Here we get an opportunity to interact, hopefully, with the same kids, the same families, week after week, month after month, Lord willing, year after year after year. And so uh, we just appreciate your prayers that we could minister to these kids, these families, in a way that uh, is ordained by the Holy Spirit, in a way that is led by him. Because uh, that's my job description. That's what we've been called here to do. But I, uh, we don't want to force it, you know. Uh, we trust that Jesus will bridge those pathways, and we, we want to walk down them as he sees fit. Thank you. Thank you both. Well, if you all join me in prayer um, specifically, and I encourage you all um, to take some time, take the opportunity to introduce yourselves to Nate and Adriana. This is a big group. You guys have to learn two new names. They have a few more to learn, so introduce yourselves um, and welcome them to their family and, and pray with me now for them as they... Uh, start their ministry here at Calvary. Father, thank you so much for this morning and um, just the blessing it is to look out and see um, a church family gathered together, uh, specifically on Fellowship Sunday, that we can all come together corporately and, and worship together in one service. I just thank you for that blessing that we have. Uh, I pray specifically now for, for Nate and Adriana as they start um, some full-time vocational ministry, specifically here at Calvary. I pray that we as a church family would surround them with um, those relationships that, that Nate was talking about that can only be founded as deeply as they can on a spiritual level with our relationship with the Holy Spirit um, and how we have that in common as believers. I pray that you give him wisdom and discernment as he comes alongside parents and students, um, specifically in the middle and high school, um, and that you would just bless the ministry, Lord, knowing that it is not people um, that further the ministry, but as you, and we are simply your tools for the ministry. Thank you for the blessing to bring him to Calvary, um, and in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, as the offering is received now, let's all stand together and worship the Lord.
soul and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit. is the reason we are gathered here this morning. He bore the cross. He defeated the grave. As it says in Isaiah 57, out of the anguish of his soul, he will see and be satisfied. And now it says in 2 Corinthians 5, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. Hallelujah. Sing in Christ alone. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in Gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid. sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God.
through our Lord Jesus Christ. The ground began to shake, the stone was rolled away, His perfect love could not be overcome. Sing it together. Now death, where is your sting? Our resurrected King has led a new defeat. Forever He is glorified. Forever He is lifted high. Forever He is risen. He is alive.
we acknowledge that, and we thank you that you are a mighty one to save, that while we were sinning, while we were running away, you brought us together, and now to set us apart for your glory, for your holy purposes. Lord, we pray that even now uh, you would give us ears to hear your word as it's proclaimed, and we thank you, Lord. You've gathered us all together in a room. More than that, you have gathered us as your children, and we're grateful for that. So we're listening now as a body, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. You know, there are times in the life of, of a family where you get to celebrate the love uh, that God has given you one for another and just the joy of each other's company. And this is one of those days for our church family. It's an opportunity for us to just reflect on how good and wise it was of the Lord Jesus Christ to not leave us alone in this difficult world of sin and suffering and sorrow, but rather to make us part of a body, to make us each members of a body, to be supported by one another, to be encouraged by one another, corrected by one another, exhorted by one another, helped by one another. How gracious our good shepherd is to make us part of a flock. And that's what we're here to celebrate. Today it's our focus. This is Fellowship Sunday, and one of our core values is loving community. We want this to be truly a loving community, a place where each and every one can find encouraging Christian friendships, where you can find those to support you when you're having a tough time, and those whom you can help with your spiritual gifts as you minister in the body. That's going to be the theme of the message, so I want to invite you to turn to Hebrews chapter 13. We're taking a break from our study of the book of Isaiah this morning to focus on the topic of fellowship in the church. And in Hebrews 13, the concluding chapter of the book of Hebrews, the author is going to give the early Christians a series of instructions about how to have edifying relationships and fellowship in the context of the body of Christ, the church. And from these practical instructions in Hebrews 13, we're gonna glean 20 ways to be a blessing to your church. 20 ways to be a blessing to your church. Now, I know some of you like to take notes. I'm gonna ask you not to do that this morning. I want you to put your pencils down, just look up, look at the screen, don't look at me too much, that'll burn a hole in your retina or something. But just listen, and my guess is is that one or two of these is gonna be something that the Holy Spirit is gonna drive deep into your heart, and I'm hoping that as we kind of rapid fire move through this that the right principles will get to the right hearts this morning. So 20 ways to be a blessing to your church. We're gonna move really rapidly through these. First, cultivate relational tenacity. Cultivate relational tenacity. Avoid fight or flight reactions to disagreements and conflicts. How can you be a blessing to your church family? Well, be relationally tenacious. Look at Hebrews chapter 13, verse one, which simply says, let love of the brethren continue. And I want you to notice that key word, continue. Note that the writer assumes that the Christians already have love for one another. How can he assume that? Well, because throughout the teachings of Jesus, throughout the New Testament, and particularly in the book of 1 John, love for the brethren is said to be one of the key signs that someone is born again. If you truly know Jesus Christ, you will love other Christians. And if you've never had a love for the brethren, there's never been new birth. And so one of the things I always tell people is if, is if you really would prefer not to have to go to church, that should tell you something. Because you love to be with those you love. And if you would prefer not to be here, it's probably because you don't love the people who are here and you probably don't love the one who called us here and gathered us together. 
So this verse presupposes that love for the brethren already exists in the heart of the true believer. So the exhortation here is to let love of the brethren continue. The focus on making sure that brotherly love continues telling us is, is telling us that the challenge is not so much to have love, but to maintain it. That's the real challenge, is to maintain our love for one another. The real challenge is not whether, whether brotherly love is present in our hearts, but whether it will persist over time and persevere despite challenges and even conflicts. The issue is how deep and long-lasting is our love. And so verse one is an exhortation to avoid the temptation of fight or flight reactions to the inevitable disagreements and conflicts and stepping of toes that happens in any group of human beings. We are a flock, Jesus says, of sheep, and as we follow the shepherd, we're going to bump into one another. We're going to step on each other's toes. Somebody's going to, if you've ever been around sheep, they're exceptionally stinky. And sometimes that can, you know, cause a reaction, but we need relational tenacity. So when there's a conflict between you and a another member of the church, hang in there. Don't attack and don't cut and run. Keep applying scripture. Keep showing forbearance. Keep forgiving. Keep responding with good even if others are sinning towards you. Cultivate relational tenacity. This is a key trait of the mature Christian. Let love of the brethren continue. Now that's kind of the header for the whole chapter, so now he's gonna lay out what it means to let love continue. So this brings us to our second principle, which is be intentional in reaching out to people you don't know. Avoid neglecting visitors. Verse two says, remember, it says this, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. Now the key word here is hospitality and showing hospitality to strangers, those you don't know. And this verse says that some people who offered hospitality actually hosted angels without realizing it. In scripture, angels often appeared in human form to accomplish their divine missions. So the author is telling the early Christians that if they regularly, regularly extend hospitality to strangers, it is possible that at some point they could help an angel on his mission without even realizing it. Now the wording of this verse implies that this was a rare event, even in the New Testament era where direct angelic interventions were more frequent and overt. It was rare even then, but it did happen. He's referring specifically to at least one occasion that he knows. And the application for us now is clear. Don't just greet and talk to people you know. It says show hospitality to strangers. Don't just invite close friends over for dinner after church. Invite the visitor that you may meet in the lobby. I want you to imagine if an angel did walk into Calvary Bible Church just on some random Sunday and he's sent on some divine mission and his mission takes him through our doors. What would he report back to the Lord Jesus Christ who is the head of the church? Would he report back that he was warmly greeted, that he was extended hospitality, that there is love and warmth in this congregation, or would he say, I walked in and walked out unnoticed and unwelcomed? We need to have an eye out for visitors, for those who we don't know. I want our church to be a place where every visitor is treated with the warmth and the honor that we would show to that person if they were an angel. I think that's the point of this verse. We should treat every visitor with the warmth and honor we would show to an angel. After all, according to this verse, someday one of them might be. Principle number three, be a refuge for the oppressed. Avoid turning your back on those in need. Verse three says, remember the prisoners as though in prison with them and those who are ill-treated since you yourselves also are in the body. And so this verse encourages us to remember in prayer and in care 
two types of persecuted Christians. The prisoners, these are those who have been unjustly imprisoned for their faith, and the ill-treated, those whose employers or families or societies are persecuting and mistreating them because of their faith. We are to remember the persecuted church, and we are to pray and care for them. Principle number four, bless the church by being faithful to your spouse. Avoid sins which require church discipline. Look at verse four. It says, marriage is to be held in honor among all, and the marriage bed is to be undefiled. For fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Beloved, the sacred vows of marriage must be honored by all. Why do your elders and pastors defend the marriage vows through church discipline? Because we are commanded that marriage must be honored by all, not just the couple, but by everyone in the church. The warning here is a stark one. Fornicators and adulterers will be judged by God. That is why church discipline in these kind of situations is actually a merciful thing to do. It's actually a very gracious thing for a church to do. It's a loving attempt by the church family to rescue someone and pull them back from a destructive path which will cause great harm to children and to their spouse. And it's also a path which will bring God's judgment upon them personally unless they repent. And so the purpose of church discipline is to lovingly restore someone so that they won't face God's judgment. They're heading towards a cliff, and if we love them, we will do everything we can to pull them back. And Jesus has given us instructions on how we are to do that. Principle number five, be content with your current financial status Avoid prioritizing making money above the fellowship of the church. Look at verse five, it says, make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. So notice that the key to financial contentment is remembering that God has promised to never leave or forsake you. Be content with what you have and avoid the temptation to prioritize money above your family, above your church, above other things which are much more important. Principle number six, develop humble confidence in Christ. Avoid the personal insecurity which makes a person thin-skinned and too easily offended. Look at verse six, it says, we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? The proverb says, the fear of man brings a snare. Insecure people are thin-skinned. Every little thing offends them. They weren't noticed the way they want to be noticed. Someone didn't speak to them the way they thought they should be spoken to. They weren't chosen for this or that, or they feel neglected in some way. They are thin-skinned. They are personally insecure, and that manifests in the church. People who know that God is their helper will be forbearing people, and they will be forgiving people. Principle number seven Imitate the strengths of spiritual mentors, but avoid imitating their weaknesses. Look at verse seven, it says, remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you, and considering the result of their conduct, imitate their faith. So the command here is to imitate the faith of spiritual mentors. But notice that this verse also calls for discernment. We are to consider the result of their conduct and then imitate their faith. So in the ways that a spiritual mentor's conduct is good and right, we should imitate them. But in the ways their conduct is not good or right, we should not imitate them. A wise person is teachable and eager to learn from a number of spiritual mentors. But a wise and mature person is also discerning, and he realizes that even highly respected leaders 
are sinners who make mistakes. And so they learn to learn not only from the positive example of spiritual leaders, but from their negative examples as well. I tell my children all the time, learn both lessons from me. Where I obey the Lord, imitate that. Where you see that I disobey the Lord, learn from that error and turn away from it. Number eight, realize that only Jesus is immutable, meaning doesn't change. Avoid the inevitable disappointment of hero worship. Look at verse eight, it says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Only he doesn't change. Everybody else is fickle. Everybody else can change. People change. Your spiritual heroes may fall, they may fail, they may flake out, they may deeply disappoint you. And when you watch when Christian leaders fall, they leave in their wake a whole bunch of people who are destroyed in their faith. Why? Because they were following a man instead of following the Lord. Your faith needs to be in Christ who never disappoints. The scripture says, he who trusts in him will never disappoint. Your parents may fail you. Your pastors may fail you. Your spiritual heroes, the famous Christians out there may fall and fail you. The only one who never will is the Lord Jesus Christ. So realize he alone does not change and him alone must be your trust. Principle number nine, be firmly anchored in sound doctrine Avoid controversies and debates which don't strengthen the heart by grace. Look at verses 9 through 12. Do not be carried away by varied and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods, through which those who were so occupied were not benefited. We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy place by the high priest as an offering for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people through his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Here the writer of Hebrews is warning his people not to get bogged down in one of the key controversies of their day because he says it has nothing to do with growing in grace and the knowledge of Christ. This debate doesn't strengthen the heart by grace. So avoid debates and controversies which don't strengthen the heart by grace. About every year or so, out on the internet, on social media, there's some big debate that happens kind of within Christian circles and people get so wrapped up in them and the one thing that you notice year after year is that those who get bogged down in those controversies don't have their hearts strengthened by grace. It just becomes a bitter fight. Principle number 10, cheerfully bear the reproach of Christ Avoid compromising on truths which are controversial in your family or at work. Look at verses 13 and 14. It says, so let us go out to him, that is Jesus, outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we do not have a lasting city, but we are seeking the city which is to come. You can't follow Christ without bearing his reproach. Jesus says, if they hated me, they'll hate you. If they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. You can't follow Christ without lots of people disparaging you because of it. So just deal with that. Be ready to suffer for his namesake and like the early Christians, consider it a privilege to suffer for the name of Christ. It's an honor to bear his reproach. So let's go to him outside the camp. As he was thrust out of Jerusalem carrying a cross, let's follow him out there and bear his reproach. Verse, or principle 11, be a consistent and joyful participant in worship services. Avoid being inconsistent in attendance or discontent with what you're getting out of the service. Look at verse 15, it says, through him then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that give thanks to his name. 
Notice that the emphasis here is on corporate worship. It says, let us, this is us together, let us together continually offer praise to God. Why do we gather every week? Yes, it's so that we could encourage one another. Yes, it's to see our friends. Yes, it's so that you can use your spiritual gifts to benefit others. But first and foremost, we come here so that we continually, week after week, Sunday after Sunday, for 90 plus years now, gather it together in order to give thanks to God. That alone is reason to come. No one talks to you, you have no friends here, that is a bummer, that means probably you're not obeying the one another commands by reaching out to others, maybe they're not obeying the commands by reaching out to you, you should still come because coming here has one primary purpose and it's stated right here, through him then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of lips, that's plural, that give thanks to his name, come here for him to give him thanks. Principle number 12, give sacrificially of your time, talent, and treasure. Avoid being a religious consumer who comes to church to be served rather than to serve. Look at verse 16, it says, and do not neglect doing good and sharing. So notice, we come first to worship, but then he says, and don't neglect doing good and sharing with one another. For with such sacrifices, God is pleased, right? So we come to give thanks to him, but then as we minister to each other, that's another way we worship. He's pleased with this. Like a father who sees one of the siblings doing something kind for another, that gives him joy. So give sacrificially. Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive. So come to church each week wondering who you can encourage, who you can lift up, who you can help, who you can pray for. Don't come thinking what you can get. Come thinking what you can give. Principle 13. Obey church leaders unless they exceed the sphere of authority God has delegated to them. Avoid the chaos and divisiveness caused by ecclesiastical anarchists. Look at verse 17. It simply says, obey your leaders. Obey your leaders. Can't get much simpler than that. As Protestants, we don't believe there is a pope. We don't believe that there is one man who wields ultimate authority over all of the churches of the world. But here's something we also don't believe. We don't believe that each person is their own pope. We don't believe in a pope over all the churches, but we also don't believe that each person is their own pope. Rather, we believe, based on Titus 1.5 and other passages, that God has designed the church and he has delegated a limited amount of authority in each local church to a plurality of elders. In Titus 1.5, Titus is commanded by the Apostle Paul to appoint elders in every city, elders plural. So while we don't believe in the ecclesiastical tyranny, which results from strictly hierarchical systems, we also don't believe in the ecclesiastical anarchy, which results from everyone just doing what's right in their own eyes. We live in a society which disdains authority. People disdain the parents' authority in the home. They disdain the policeman's authority in the community. And they disdain the pastor's and elder's authority in the church. Their argument is not with men, it is with God, for he designed and created these spheres of authority. So Christians must be different. Whereas the world disdains authority, we must embrace it in its proper application. The text says, obey your leaders. We must obey the authorities God has established. And now there are a few, and only a few, biblically valid exceptions to that principle, whether in the home or in the state or in the church, For sake of time, I can't give those to you today. If you're interested in that, you can check them out in the book I wrote a couple years ago on the family, the government, and the church. Principle number 14. Unless church leaders are violating scripture, defer to their decisions even if you disagree. Avoid being a backseat driver, right? No car drives well with 18 hands on the wheel. You know, imagine trying to drive a car with over 1,000 hands on the wheel. So unless church leaders are violating scripture, defer to their decisions, even if you disagree. The Lord has designed in each of the spheres of authority for there to be a way to break impasses. 
In a marriage, sometimes there will be two different and equally valid opinions. So how can the impasse be broken? God has designed, in order to avoid deadlock and impasses in the family, that the wife should submit to her husband, Ephesians 5.22. In a similar way, in a church, there can be many equally valid opinions on a whole variety of practical issues, meeting times, what to spend money on, what to do with this room or that room, et cetera, et cetera, what to prioritize, so many things, equally valid opinions. So to avoid being bogged down by differences of opinion, God commands believers to submit to their spiritual leaders. Verse 17 says, obey your leaders and submit to them. So defer. Principle 15. Be accountable to those who are accountable to the Lord to watch over your soul. Avoid remaining on the fringes of the flock where you can stray or be dragged away before anyone can notice or intervene. The reason given why it says obey your leaders and submit to them is it says for or because they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. God knows that sheep need shepherds. So don't rob yourself of the guidance and of the spiritual protection that comes from being accountable to godly elders. Principle 16, be a source of joy and encouragement to your shepherds by thriving spiritually. Avoid being someone your pastors and elders grieve over. At the end of verse 17 it says, let them do this with joy and not with grief for this would be unprofitable for you. See, shepherds love their flock. I love you. Your elders love you. Your pastors love you. So when one of you wanders off from that straight and narrow path that the Lord Jesus is leading us all down, and when someone wanders away and then refuses our, our exhortations to return and they get dragged away by the wolves that are in this dark and fallen world, it grieves the heart of the shepherds deeply. And when sheep stray, they sometimes bite and kick at the shepherds who are trying to bring them back to the right path. And that can be deeply discouraging to a loving shepherd most pastors and elders are ultimately tender-hearted. It grieves us deeply when someone strays away from the Lord because we know what that means for them, and we care. So don't be a sheep who grieves your shepherds. Be one that encourages them by following Christ faithfully. You want to encourage your pastors and elders, walk with the Lord, walk with the Lord. It's the greatest encouragement for us. Principle 17 Pray for your leaders to have a good conscience and to live honorably. Avoid assuming that church leaders are somehow immune to trials and temptations. Notice in verse 17, it talks about the responsibility of the flock to their leaders, but now there is an exhortation in verse 18 and 19 where the writer of Hebrews says, pray for us. Pray for us, verse 18 says, for we are sure that we have a good conscience desiring to conduct ourselves honorably in all things. And I urge you all the more to do this so that I may be restored to you the sooner. Pray for us. Your pastors and elders struggle with the same trials and temptations as anyone else, so we need continual prayer. Principle 18, remember who the great shepherd is. Avoid crediting men for the work of God. Look at verses 20 through 21. Now the God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever, amen. Notice that immediately after his discussion of human leaders, the author reminds us that it is God's power that works within the church and all the glory rightly belongs to him alone. Principle 19, persevere in paying attention to the very end of each sermon. Now this is, you know, you, you, you think, okay, this is why he chose it, right? You know, no, no. Actually, so I originally taught this message at a men's conference down in Kansas back in January, but this is something that's, in the text, look at verse 22, he says, but I urge you, brethren, bear with this word of exhortation 
for I have written to you briefly. This is the, the preacher's motto, right? After writing 13 long chapters, he says, bear with me. I've been as brief as I could. But persevere in paying attention to the very end of each sermon. Avoid missing a truth you need to hear. Truth takes time to share, and you need truth. Principle 20, last one. Pay attention to changes in a fellow believer's circumstances. Avoid being unaware how each other is really doing. Verses 23 through 25. Take notice that our brother Timothy has been released, with whom if he comes soon I will see you. Greet all your leaders and all the saints. Those from Italy greet you. Grace be with you all. Take notice. He says, take notice that Timothy has been released. There's a major change in his circumstances. You need to take notice of this. Let's be a church that takes notice of major changes in the life circumstances of one another. My prayer, Calvary Bible Church family, is that we will be a Hebrews 13 church. And you are so gracious to me and my family. I'm so grateful to be a part of this body. Thank you. And I just want to pray for you. Lord, we celebrate our fellowship today. Lord, I'm so grateful for this church family. Truly a wonderful place to just be a part of the body. And thank you for all of those who have have ministered to my family, to myself. Lord, those who have exhorted me, have corrected me. Lord, those who have encouraged me, uh, lifted me up when I'm discouraged, helped me when I'm weak. Lord, I pray uh, that each and every soul will find true community here. Lord, it's our desire that we would be a loving community of those who love you above all. So help us to manifest these principles and apply them. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, in a minute, we're gonna be celebrating in baptisms, but first, let's respond together as we sing. Please stand, revive us again. Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. We praise thee, O God. Well, we come now to, I think and truly believe biblically, the most important thing that the church does, which is to celebrate and to testify of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the work that he has done in the lives of people. We're going to be celebrating baptism, and I want to just briefly explain to you 
what it is that we're about to do. We're going to have two men baptized this morning. There are three main purposes of baptism. The purposes of baptism are so rich, there's not time this morning to explain all of it, but there are three main purposes of baptism, and this is such a sacred and holy time in the life of our church. Number one, water baptism is a visible and symbolic portrayal of the invisible and spiritual baptism of the Holy Spirit that placed a person into Christ the moment they believed and were saved. The Holy Spirit, at the moment a person repents and believes, immerses them into Christ and unites them with him. This pictures that great reality. Secondly, water baptism is a public testimony of personal faith. It powerfully symbolizes the person's death, burial, and resurrection with Christ to a new life. We are showing you today what has already happened in the hearts of these men. As they do this, they're going to be pledging to the Lord to live for him all of their days. And third, water baptism is the initiatory ordinance given to the church, which marks the reception of a believer into fellowship by a local church. We're recognizing the saving grace of God in these men's life. And so we're going to celebrate this together this morning. We have two men who are going to be baptized, Ben Kingsley and Isaac Oliveras. So we're going to have the brothers come down. Yep, Isaac. Hey, share your testimony with his brother. Hey, so yeah, I've gone to Calvary Bible Church for, for a long time, uh, since I was a little kid, and I always thought it'd be great to enter the baptism via cannonball dive, but it's, it's not deep enough. <laughs> so, but yeah, no, my name is Isaac Olivatis, and uh, I wanted to take some time to share the story of God's work in my life and uh, how he drew, him, uh, drew me to him. Uh, in 2001, my parents moved uh, up to Kalamazoo, Michigan. They had previously lived in Detroit and before that, Texas, where I was born. Uh, my parents are God-fearing believers who took the time to homeschool me and my siblings to give us a strong biblical foundation. And I was in bless, uh, blessed to inherit a religious heritage, but as we know, salvation is not inherited from parents. And as I grew older, I became more and more aware of my own desire to rebel against the Lord. Uh, although I cannot turn to a specific moment in my life when I was saved, I can recognize a general season where my faith became my own and I uh, really stepped out there as, for my faith to be mine. Uh, at some point after high school, my parents started attending another church, and I stayed at Calvary, uh, and I attended the college group uh, with Jordan Dersch and uh, among others. Uh, I really floated through services at that time. I uh, just stuck around for the socializing, and uh, my actions outside of the church uh, really reflected my true heart condition. Uh, the contrast between my church self and my weekly self grew more and more drastic. You know, I was gratifying the desires of the flesh, anger, lust, envy, uh, and hate. You know, they all boiled just beneath the surface. They're rooted. Uh, in a deep anger that I just used as an excuse for my behavior. I was really eking by on a well-practiced uh, routine, and I was riding on spiritual fumes. I'm not sure of the exact time, but somewhere in there, the Lord made something click. Uh, I can distinguish two major ways that the Lord reached his hand down to me. Uh, the first is through brothers at church, whether it's bros with Bibles, kettlebell Bible study, core group. I'm eternally grateful uh, to the Lord for putting that burden on the brothers' hearts to not forsake the fellowship of believers. And they, these brothers all challenged myself and each other to be real about the sin in our lives and how we're living on a daily basis. Proverbs 27, 17 says, As iron sharpens iron, uh, so, one, so one man sharpens another. And the second... Uh, method that the Lord used uh, to draw me to him uh, was through reading his word. And as I read, I received a stronger and stronger conviction for my sins. And anger being a, a big sin in my life that I, I do still struggle with to this day, I uh, read Ephesians 4.31, and let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. And this was 
And this stood in stark contrast to my anger. It, if I was going to follow the Lord, I'd have to turn from my sin and bear fruit in keeping with repentance and let the anger go. Uh, but I was really still stuck in the church kid routine. And as I continued to read, uh, Samuel's rebuke of King Saul in 1 Samuel was especially convicting. Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is, a better, is better than to sacrifice. I was treating church attendance in the same way that King Saul was treating his sacrifices and service to the Lord. And I had heard the, the gospel from a young age, uh, but now I knew that I'd, I'd have to apply it to my life and make that the core meaning of why I should live in a Christ-like fashion. Uh, the gospel was making, as Pastor Burnett puts it, you know, the 12-inch distance from my head to my heart. And uh, with, for that, I have Colossians 2, 13, and 14. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. I'm a sinner who by the grace of God has been convicted of my sin and by the mercy of God has been pardoned from eternal death by the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. It is by faith that I continue to grow and mature. As I still struggle with anger and depression, I cling to verses such as Romans 6, 12, and through 14. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to, to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from life, from death to life, and your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under the law, but under grace. Another verse that really reflects my life as I walk forward in Christ is 1 John 4.19, we love because he first loved us, and is the heart of gratitude uh, that I, I pray that I reflect to the Lord each day. Uh, this verse has a special place in my uh, heart because it, it reminds me of the reason I have to love and serve Christ, and then along with that verse I've added uh, John 14.15, if you love me, you'll keep my commands further driving home you know, the, my conviction. These verses summarize an important aspect of my walk with God and how he drew me to him. As I continue through this life, I pray uh, for his mercy and grace. Amen. Brother, what a wonderful testimony of God's grace and his work in your life. And so I want to ask you here in the presence of these witnesses, the church body, have you acknowledged that you are a sinner? Yes. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who died for your sins, rose from the dead, and is coming again soon? I do. And is it your intention to follow him all of your days? It is. Then it is, my brother, my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death and raised in the likeness of his resurrection. <laughs> And next we have Ben Kingsley. Hi, I'm Ben Kingsley. And for the last four months, I've had the pleasure of joining you all here at Calvary. I am so grateful for all the prayers of my family, friends, and strangers that helped lead me to this very moment prayers that our gracious and compassionate God heard and answered. Almost 12 years ago to the day, I graduated with a Bachelor of Arts in Biblical Studies from the Master's University. That's John MacArthur's school. Many of you have his study Bible in your hands right now. Praise God. 12 years ago, I had, quote, all the biblical knowledge, so to speak. More biblical knowledge than 99% of the world. 
I aced courses like Old Testament survey and New Testament survey, Christian theology and introduction to biblical languages, even classes on individual books like Job. But I believed like a demon. James 2 makes it clear that even the demons believe God is one and shudder, one God above all, and there is no other. To my absolute shame and embarrassment, I believed like a demon with complete and total intellectual conviction of the perfection of God's word and the lordship of his son and the forthcoming wrath for sin. But I was dead in my trespasses, in love with this present world and a sheep that had strayed far from the one and only shepherd. For the next 12 years, I would do what was right in my own eyes. I was a lover of my own self, but it was 12 years of cognitive dissonance, meaning I lived every day of my life in tension with what I knew to be true. My head, my heart, and my actions were all disjointed. In the mirror of the word, I had seen my natural face, but I willingly forgot its appearance again and again. My testimony is one that highlights Romans 1 and the ability of ungodly man to suppress the truth in unrighteousness. I darkened my own heart, and perhaps first in line among men, I was without excuse, and I would be without excuse at the coming day of judgment. I am a professor of English at Kalamazoo College, and despite being held in so thought highest intellectual esteem among men, every day of those 12 years, I never lost the certainty that there is only one book, one word, that is Hebrews 4, living and active, one word that is sharper than any two-edged sword, one word that pierces as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow. There is only one word able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Despite being a so-called man of letters, my soul only bore witness to the salvific, the saving power of one word and of one gospel. Four months ago, in late evening, trembling in my kitchen, I read Romans chapter 2, and our Lord pierced my heart. Verse 4, or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance. God's kindness in my life, his long patience and forbearance, was and is irrefutable. It was on display in every aspect of my life. Through his kindness, he softened and drew and illumined my heart. His kindness led me to repentance. That night, he preached John chapter 3 to me. Like Nicodemus, I needed to be born again. There is perhaps no other verse that, be, that, that can become as stale on the tongue and in the heart of an unrepentant, unbelieving church attendee than John chapter 3, verse 16. That night, God took what had been stale for me and made it full of salt. Whereas before I was deaf, I was given ears to hear. I was given a new and listening heart. For God so loved the world 
that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Our Lord turned me from my sin. God washed me, and he put away my evil. Our good shepherd placed me on his shoulders and carried me back to his flock. While I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. And since that night, only by his grace, I have practiced the truth and come to the light. May this work be evidenced as having been done by God. I could never, ever have begun or sustained this new man. Praise Jesus Christ, the Lord of our salvation. May we live to celebrate. May we live to extol his everlasting glory. Amen. Brother Ben, as I listen to your testimony, I'm reminded it's not being at church that saves, not having a Bible degree that saves. It is coming to that moment where the Holy Spirit opens a darkened mind and a hardened heart. The Word of God pierces the heart and mind to show that you're a sinner and that Jesus Christ, who died and rose again, is the only way of salvation. Brother, have you acknowledged that you are a sinner before a holy God? Absolutely. And do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Absolutely. That he died for your sins, was buried, rose again on the third day, ascended to heaven, and is coming back again? Yes, absolutely. And is it your intention to live for him all of your days? Yes, absolutely. Then it is my great joy, my brother, to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death and raised in the likeness of his resurrection. Hey, brother, you're fine. I don't get the heart of it. Thank you, buddy. What a testimony of that for you. In a moment here, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Table together on Fellowship Sunday. We get to celebrate uh, both of the two ordinances of the church, the ordinance of initiation and then of continuation. And so begin preparing your hearts for that. But let's join in prayer uh, for these two brothers as they live for the Lord. May they be fruitful and may many others come to a saving knowledge of Christ through their testimony. Lord, we're so grateful for the greatest miracle of all. Lord, the transformation of a heart the passing from death to life, from eternal judgment to eternal life. Lord, from being in enmity with you to being a child of God. Lord, this is all by grace, all by the finished work of Christ. And so, Lord, we give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. And Lord, we pray for our two brothers that they would walk with you in accordance with your truth and, a, and in your ways and that they would bear much fruit for your glory. Use them mightily, Lord, to spread this good news to other hearts that so desperately need to hear it. And we give you praise for your saving work in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Some amazing testimonies. You guys need to get a chance to get to know Isaac and Ben more. Um, Ben's brother actually is a professor at the Master's College. And um, he's been praying for his brother for years that the Lord will work mightily in his life. But then what it's only of the Lord, isn't it? And you know what, as I thought about that this morning and thinking about our time of now communion, isn't it amazing that even on this fellowship Sunday, what a better way than fellowship around the Lord's table? This being a time to fellowship and, and to remember the gracious work of Christ and how that impacts everyone in the room. And we just saw a gracious demonstration of that in the baptismal tank this morning. But even as we reflect about how they impacted not only Isaac and Ben, and, but how they testified to us about God's gracious work on the cross, and how that truth changed them forever. But that's what the gospel is about, isn't it? That changed truth. That, well, that truth is surrounded by remembering the work of Christ on the cross. 
which is described for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And I read that if want the men to come forward to begin to prepare. For I receive for you from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night which in which he was portrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after a supper and saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you'll proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup and the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. To remind, it says here, to remember as it applied even to the Lord's Supper here in remembrance of me means that we as participants this morning of this time of baptism of communion are to remember the sacrifice of the death of Christ and how the memory of the greatness of that sacrifice should cause each and every one of us as believers in Christ to abstain from sin. To become a new believer in Christ, we should want to live a new life. We remember how Christ gave up his body and endured the cross for you and I. He became a living sacrifice. Not only gave us his body, but he, he spilt his blood as a way to cover our sins. Because we, as I, and as Ben and Isaac testified, testified this morning, all separated from Christ. And the only way to have a relationship with Christ was through the sacrifice of the death of Christ on the cross with his body and the remission of sin through this blood of Christ. I love how Samuel Rutherford describes Christ's sacrificial death. He says this, Christ in his death made an exchange. Christ bartered his life in exchange for you and I. Christ never beguiled you, but instead he took the shame and gave you glory. He took the curse and gave you the blessing. He took death and gave you life. Let's just, now as the men will come, let us pray for this bread as the men will just begin to distribute it.
We also need to remember as we partake of this, this is for those who have a relationship with Christ, just as Isaac and Ben testified, and men who have, you can tell even as Ben's testimony, you can have all the religion, you can have all the head knowledge, but if you really not have committed your life to Christ, then this is not for you this morning, just pass it away. But for those who are in Christ, let's do this in remembrance of him now. thank you we thank you for this fellowship Sunday in remembrance of Christ gracious sacrifice for me I don't deserve this but it's been given freely for me let me reflect and remember that various truths today amen Man, why don't you distribute the cup for us? I once was lost in darkest night. Yet thought I knew the way, the sin that promised joy and life, and led me to the grave. I had no hope that you would own a rebel to your will, and if you had. Different to the cause, you looked upon my helpless state and led me to the cross. And I beheld God's love displayed, you suffered in my place. You bore the wrath reserved for me.
those words again. Surrender all. Hallelujah. All I have is Christ. Hallelujah. Jesus is my can't think of a better day on a fellowship Sunday to have communion, to hear some men coming to Christ, great message, and now we get a chance to go fellowship together in Christ, right? And that's what we're here for. Let's just thank him for that, and then I'm going to ask Pastor Dan Johnson to come up and give us some announcements. Dillard, thank you. What a great day to be able to fellowship this day but tell her it's all because of Christ because of the word because of the work of Christ help us the Lord as we go throughout our day even as we go into our time of fellowship that we would remind ourselves in our conversations of your gracious work in our life because that's all that counts everything else is rubble and these things I pray. Amen. Pastor Dan? Oh, I'm sorry. I got ahead of myself. I was so into the com- communion. I was thinking about, the, let's take this together, remembrance of him. I got a little overwhelmed with communion this morning. <laughs> Dan, Pastor Dan. Thank you, Pastor Dave. We have over a thousand people here this morning. Think of it, a thousand people, one thousand something. Oh. What a see, this is Fellowship Sunday. We're all together, a thousand people, and we're gonna we had a great service this morning. Now we're gonna have a a, a very a very good a, a very passable lunch. <laughs> now, this is the instructions. Now listen carefully. Now you can exit to the left, you can exit to the right, but head out towards the parking lot. And I've got four serving lines. And if, uh, and, and if any of you are serving, it's supposed to be servers, get out right now, okay? <laughs> get out, okay? But I have four serving lines, and so we're going to be directing you to each serving line as the lines get long. So I'm going to make sure that we, we feed you in, a, in as quick amount of time as possible. I've got hot dogs, grilled hot dogs, pulled pork, sandwiches, potato chips, cookies, water. I've got several treat stations of popcorn, watermelon, ice cream, lemonade. Uh, you can set. In, uh, we have a tent out in the field. We've got a couple canopies. Uh, I've got, you can sit on the un, un, overhang by the chapel. You can go into the chapel. You can uh, eat in your car. You can, uh, you, can do, you can eat wherever you want to eat. I don't care. But we've got enough seats for all of you. And I want all of you to, to, to have a lunch and sit around and fellowship with Christ and the Lord and what he's done for you. And just I want you all to know that in Christian love we can all get together. And uh, that's what we want to do. And even activities, I got some activities. I have a bounce house. So parents, you need to supervise your kids. And kids, you need to supervise your parents. And uh, I have some skill games, a beanbag toss, a hula hoop. We have some field games. And it's going to be just a fun time of fellowship. And we're going to close about uh, 2.30. And, uh, and I just want you to know that I welcome all of you. And I want you all to feel part of Calvary Bible Church. So let me just pray for the food. And I'm going to dismiss you. Okay? Thank you, Lord, for the blessings we have this morning. Thank you for the food that's about to be provided. And we just, just praise and thank you for this day. In Christ's name we pray.